right, Al almost a full house. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm Reggie Tiller, acting superintendent for the Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument and also the acting superintendent for the Freedom Riders National Monument in Anniston. So welcome. Um, this morning, we're gonna do some relatively quick, yesterday it was three words uh, that we started off with and today it will be one word uh, I know some of you weren't here yesterday, so uh, give this just a little bit of thought. Uh, one word to describe your thoughts or your feelings about the Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument. But before you do that, uh, your name and the organization uh, that you uh, work with. All right, well now I'm gonna turn it over to Ben West. Also not well suited to be tied to a microphone, but uh, I will do my best uh, to, 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 to stay put. Um, but uh, good morning, everybody. So I'll do a slightly bigger introduction. So uh, again, my name is Ben uh, West. I work for the Park Service in Atlanta in our regional office. Um, the Park Service's regional office, there's 70 different parks uh, in the southeast region, which is nine states uh, and the territory, or, uh, the Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, so we've got 70 parks and in the Southeast Regional Office in Atlanta we help uh, help them with various things. My particular uh, business practice area is planning, uh, strategic planning for the Park Service. Um, and obviously with a brand new park with a staff of one, uh, they need a lot of help uh, uh, to to get things going and, and so um, more than anything, I, I wanted to just say a few uh, words of thanks and, and sort of put in context what we're, what we're doing today. Um, so for those of you that are new today, you know, you heard people from Michigan and Arizona and Connecticut and uh, all over the place and you're thinking, well, why on earth are they here? Well, if you didn't know, the, the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the Civil Rights Institute co-sponsored a uh, a, a preservation leadership training program uh, which is going on this entire week um, and uh, so that's these people here are coming to learn to learn about uh, strategies for uh, historic preservation from business strategies to preservation strategies to civic engagement interpretives uh, a whole range of things that they cover over the course of the week uh, and in particular they're doing a case study in one of the buildings in the fourth avenue business district the the Gaston Commercial Building directly across the street from the motel. Uh, and they're gonna be working in small groups, uh, coming up with exciting, elaborate uh, uh, ideas for the future for that building and perhaps even for, for some of the connected assets in that 4th Avenue district. Uh, district. So, um, so it's a wonderful opportunity for these guys. And so honestly, the Park Service, I'm co-opting the meeting and sort of using it as a, as a chance to to, to do some of the things that, that we were hoping to do, um, and that is to get some feedback from, um, from, in particular, those of you that have come just for today. You are stakeholders in Birmingham and Montgomery and other places where you have a, 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 a vested interest, uh, whether it's business, again, preservation, uh, community, whatever, uh, blessings, spiritual, uh, you know, you have an interest in, in this monument and we very much want to to, to drill deeper and, and get a sense of what those interests are what your your concerns are so we've got a a, a session this morning this it's really going to be a, a facilitated dialogue and even for those of you that are from out of town you know don't really know the um, the, the resource as well uh, we appreciate your perspectives maybe from the outside looking in I mean you've seen a little bit sort of the tip of the iceberg of, of um, of what's going on here so when we're we're asking you questions about what what do you think are challenges that the park service might have in in getting this thing off the ground or what are some opportunities uh we would appreciate you know even again those of you that don't have intimate knowledge to sort of share your thoughts uh, based on the uh, the site visit and other other exposure you've had so far um uh, so i'm going to go through a um, a quick presentation um, that sort of gets us to where we are um, and, and before that, again, I really want to recognize Brent Legs with the National Trust, uh, Melissa Smiley with the city of, of, of Birmingham, really two very important people 
uh, that, that helped get this national monument established in the first place. Uh, Jack, Sar uh, what Pye uh, Jack Sargent, uh, you're a principal now. Uh, Jack, P Jack Pyburn uh, is another person I really want to thank. Uh, a, a lot of the graphics, a lot of the materials that you see, uh, we are borrowing very liberally from work that he has done as sort of the lead historic architect on, on some of the work here. So uh, thank you, Jack, very much. Um, so, all right. So let's look at uh, my notes following along with my slide orders. All right, so we're going to cover why the monument was created, do a little bit of stroll down memory lane, what's included. Somebody mentioned the boundary. That's been a big uh, topic of conversation. I forgot to mention we're having, in addition to this stakeholder meeting, we had a public meeting across the street at 16th Street Baptist Church last night. We're having another one tonight over at Bethel Baptist Church, so we're doing sort of the same thing with the public uh, this week as well. Um, um, so, you know, what's included in the National Monument? A lot of people have a lot of questions. Uh, who are the partners that we're working with, and how can you help in defining the future for this park? Those are those are sort of the fundamental things that we're going to cover. And uh, so let's let's just quickly remind each other about um, what is a national monument. A lot of um, press and uh, interest lately in national monuments. The uh, President Trump, one of his first executive orders was um, signing a, uh, a, an order asking the Secretary of Interior to uh, go back and relook at some of the more recently created national monuments uh, by the, uh, President Obama and even President Clinton um, and Bush, I guess, in theory. Uh, um, and so they have been looking at, the Secretary of Interior's office has been looking at some of the, the national monuments. Uh, this one here, the Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument, was not one of the ones that was targeted uh, for, for review or reconsideration. And candidly, I'm not even entirely sure what, uh, what conclusions they're coming to. But um, just the idea of, of how uh, the president exercises his authority uh, to establish a national monument was, was what's been sort of revisited to some degree. And so just as a reminder, there are two ways that, uh, and if you're working in a community and you think you've got resources that are important to become a national park, uh, there's two ways you can become a national, national park unit. Number one would be legislatively, right? Uh, you have your congressman, senator introduce legislation that goes through Congress, gets signed by the president, and most of the units of the national park system are established that way. There's enabling legislation uh, that's signed and creates uh, whatever park um, uh, exists. Uh, the other way is through uh, uh, the authority that's granted through the Antiquities Act, and the first bullet talks about uh, it's established by the president that protects objects of historic or scientific interests that are situated upon lands owned or controlled by the federal government. So it's two really important things. Number one, you got to have awesome, important, historic, scientific objects uh, that need protection, and then you've got to have some federal ownership, and that's very important in sort of understanding how the, the federal government came to own property here in Birmingham to get this uh, national monument established. And the other two bullets are, are really important uh, for folks. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different national parks. There's, there's national parks, national seashores, national military parks, um, national recreation areas. Uh, and national monuments, right? Uh, and the, the reality is they they're all have, you know, slightly different nuances in their names, but uh, once they're designated, there's really no effect. They're all treated the same. They all fall under the same policies and regulations, and they are all managed similarly uh, to protect uh, uh, and preserve the enjoyment of those resources and values. Um, so again, just reflecting, so why was it established here in Birmingham? And there's really four fundamental reasons that, uh, um, that made it so. The first one should be obvious after, after our site visit yesterday. There's just so many uh, listed National Historic Landmarks, historic structures, uh, uh, stories, objects. There's no shortage of those objects and, uh, uh, here in, in Birmingham related to the Civil Rights uh, Movement. The second and Probably even the most important aspect is uh, the successful and very powerful grassroots efforts that, uh, that's been going on for years. Somebody said long overdue, and, and I think uh, we heard that loud and clear that uh, there's been efforts, and, and, and obviously it takes both a committed 
not only, I say locally and nationally, but groups like the National Trust for Historic Preservation, you know, they were catalysts for, for getting that level of support and, and recognition and visibility. Uh, and then the third bill, it again, goes without saying, you've got to have effective political leadership. It starts with the mayor, it starts with, you know, peoples around the table. You are all effective, both grassroots and, and in some ways engaging in your political leadership to, to, to make things happen. And in fact, the whole revisiting of, of the National Monument idea that's happening now um, really doesn't apply in this community because there was such strong, again, from my observation, uh, civic and political, I mean, there's no one that could say, again, you didn't know about this, you weren't supportive of this. Uh, when we had our public meetings, it was overwhelming support for, for moving forward with this. And then the last bullet, again, circles back to the idea of there has to be a donation of interests to the federal government. And in this case, uh, the city of Birmingham donated through the National Trust for Historic Preservation. They helped us uh, donate some land and some interests that uh, we're going to talk about here in a second so that uh, uh, the National Monument could be established in the first place. Um, if you have questions, I'm, uh, I'd like to maybe run through my piece of the presentation and then maybe we'll, we'll open it up for some presentations before, uh, uh, questions before uh, we, I turn it over to Sarah for our exercise, if you don't mind waiting. Um, the next series of slides, honestly, are just, just pictures of, of things that we've already seen. The, um, uh, I really won't, um, everyone here has, a, I think, a really strong understanding of the of the significance of the events that happened at, at, at all the different places, uh, the catalyst for uh, uh, the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Act, all the things that came as a result of, uh, of the activities here. Um, um, the, uh, the, the biggest thing that I, I do want to highlight is uh, that the proclamation, and everybody got a copy of the proclamation itself, uh, um, and it's wonderful, wonderful reading. It hopefully, uh, for those of you that are historians, did a good job of, of summarizing all the things that I just blitzed over <laughs> in terms of the historical significance. Um, but uh, but you, you, you do have copies of the proclamation. It was established on January 12th, 2017. Um, and, and really the focus of the National Monument is the Gaston Motel. And this is, a, again, an excerpt straight out of the the proclamation, the Gaston Motel served as the headquarters for the Project C campaign um, that challenged unfair laws designed to limit the freedoms of African Americans and ensure racial inequality. Uh, Project C succeeded in focusing the world's attention on racial injustice in America and creating the momentum for federal civil rights legislation. So it really, it starts with the Gaston. I'm gonna list now again the, uh, the pictures of those assets, uh, but the Gaston is the part that the, the federal government actually has ownership of. Um, but, um, uh, you know, the, the, the location is the headquarters for Project C, the story of A.G. Gaston himself as the entrepreneur, the, fourth, the connection with the 4th Avenue Business District and, and the activities that went on there, the, the idea of what the Gaston Motel was even to African Americans, the people that were stayed here, and the entertainers, the uh, celebrities, the, all the people that... Um, um, you know, we're, we're able to stay in what was the time one of the finest institutions, uh, not institutions, but uh, assets for our African Americans to travel. Um, uh, you guys have seen these pictures uh, very much so. Got a chance to see uh, the, the top corner there, the, the King Suite, uh, where Abernathy and uh, Andrew Young and others came, uh, Shuttlesworth. Um, 16th Street Baptist Church, uh, again, is recognized by the proclamation um, for the things that happened there, the, the bombing that we heard about of the little girls, the, uh, the marches that, and the meetings that happened there in the 16th Street. Again, I, I'm just going to go over this very quickly. These are all places specifically called out and mentioned in the proclamation. Kelly Ingham Park, um, the activities that happened there uh, during the spring of, of 1963. Um, the St. Paul United Methodist Church, the Masonic Temple, all had different roles. The Masonic Temple obviously was before 1963, it was in the 50s as the headquarters for the NAACP and, um, um, and the things that happened there. Um, and then of course, Bethel Baptist Church, uh, Fred Shuttlesworth is, is truly the central figure here in Birmingham, the establishment of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Um, the connection with Freedom Riders, uh, the Freedom Riders, uh, Shuttlesworth 
went to Anniston and, and brought them back here to Birmingham. Um, so there's, there's even connections with the other park uh, down the road. Uh, both Bethel Baptist and um, uh, 16th Street are National Historic Landmarks. Um, and then where, where we are, of course, is the Civil Rights Institute, not historic, but certainly a, a partner and recognized as a, as a partner for interpretation and, and, and uh, operations. Uh, Reggie's office is here. Andrea Taylor uh, has graciously allowed him to stay in the space here. And, um, and that's actually one of the sort of visions that we have, and we're going to talk about it here in a little bit, uh, for, for how to integrate the Gaston and our presence uh, along with what, what already exists. Um, you know, 16th Street is giving tours. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of wonderful infrastructure and a lot of wonderful things that are already happening that we're hoping to, to just um, expand upon. Um, so I do get asked this a good bit, what's included in the National Monument? There's a graphic up front. Um, and so the boundary itself encompasses 18 acres uh, and includes the, the centerpiece there is the Gaston Motel. It, uh, for those of you that were a little more involved, Terry Sewell, the uh, representative from Congress, uh, introduced some legislation. The boundary uh, for our particular National Monument is virtually identical to what she introduced for legislation. Um, I think uh, somebody mentions too small. Um, that's a really interesting uh, observation and we certainly heard even last night from the public, that, you know, why didn't you include this or there's other things that, that perhaps might have been included. One of, the, one of the important, and I wish I'd have uh, memorized it, uh, but um, the Antiquities Act talks about protecting these objects of historic significance, but doing it with the smallest area compatible for the preservation and protection of those resources. So again, the review that's happening now is sort of the idea of, well, you know, you went this big and you really should have gone this big because this is the smallest area. So it really is in the eye of the beholder, right? What constitute uh, the, the smallest area that's uh, uh, necessary to preserve those resources. In, in our case, um, the, this other graphic down here on the floor shows, as those of you from Birmingham, there's three, well, three districts now. That's not the, exactly the right way to describe it, but you've got the, the National Register District for the Civil Rights, which is a large district that encompasses a lot of downtown Birmingham. Um, there's the Fourth Avenue National Register District, which again focuses just on the African American Entrepreneurial District on, along Fourth Avenue. Um, and now you've got the National Monument. And what we sought to do was sort of pick the heart of, of all of those districts and, and try to draw a boundary that, uh, that reflects, again, and includes uh, some of the most contributing resources to, um, to what happened here. Um, and then a lot of people ask, uh, um, you know, Bethel Baptist Church uh, uh, is, is not in the boundary. Bethel Baptist is about six miles outside of town, clearly a nationally significant, important, contributing resource uh, to the story. Um, and um, the hope is that it is mentioned. There's very specific uh, uh, language that asks that we establish partnerships with them. And there's certainly the, the potential to, you know, maybe expand it in the future to include, to include them if, if uh, circumstances change. Um, I get asked this a lot, right? So uh, private property, I own property in the National Monument. What the heck does that mean? Uh, uh, and I don't know if we've got, well, Alabama Power may have some. Uh, um, uh, well, 16th Street, I mean, there's a lot of private property that's, uh, that's within the boundary of the National Monument. And um, I just want to reaffirm to everybody that we don't have any kind of property interest in any city or privately owned buildings other than the Gaston. Um, and that our laws and regulations really don't apply to those properties within the boundary. Um, including it in a boundary does allow for cooperation and partnerships to manage, interpret those resources. And then the last bullet really is, a, is an important one, that it, not bullet, but the last part of it, is it allows opportunities over time for acquisition of additional lands or interests in lands uh, from willing sellers or donors. And you know, uh, parks a lot of times when they're created have these large boundaries and they seek to incorporate what are the most important resources that if those were to go away, if somebody bought 16th Street Church and wanted to demolish it, boy, the Park Service would want to have the opportunity to step in and, uh, and try to keep that from happening. And by virtue of it being in the boundary, 
gives us a lot more latitude uh, to be able to do that. It's not like we're going to come in and, you know, eminent domain and, and take over these assets. That's just not going to happen. And in, in, in these days, it's more just an opportunity uh, to, to, again, work together um, on technical assistance, on interpretation, and then potentially on acquisition in the future. Okay, so this is a fun little um, animation that, um, not, so I'm focusing on the Gaston, right? So, And, um, and then the uh, funeral home on the corner, right? So in 1954, uh, that's when the Gaston Motel first opened. You had the original wing there on the left, uh, the lobby and the restaurant, and you'll see the little driveway. That's where we walked in, for those of you that went on the tour. Um, so that was in 1954. There were 29 rooms at the time. Um, fast forward to... Later in 1954, um, you had the expansion in the kitchen. They added the restaurant, sort of the beginnings of the supper club. Um, in later that year in 1954, uh, the real big expansion came in 1968 where they added on even more to the kitchen, uh, added the big um, supper club there on the corner, uh, the restaurant, added the second story uh, with um, uh, additional motel rooms. They added another 26 uh, rooms, the banquet hall, um, you'll notice the one of those outbuildings was removed in 1968. And then, um, you know, that's basically the same configuration today. You'll notice the other building is gone. Uh, it was removed around 1982. The, the funeral home, likewise, was removed around that time frame. Uh, and, and we learned yesterday, again, just as a reminder, 1982, the, the motel went through a, a dramatic uh, transformation to an assisted living facility. They converted all, all the single rooms to double rooms, made suites, uh, and, and the biggest effect of that really is, as Jack has stated, is they um, really, all the integrity of the inside of the, of the, of the motel was re really lost when they, uh, when they made that major improvement in 1982. So, um, so a big part of what, what Jack has done uh, for us, um, and the last little bit I, I guess I wanted to highlight too is, is the ownership. So you'll, as you, as you look at it, there's the green sort of piece on the left-hand side and the yellow piece on the right-hand side. Hopefully that makes sense as you look at it. Um, so when the city of, of Birmingham started working with us and the National Trust, uh, we worked out a strategy where they would donate to us uh, in fee. So we own, we, the National Park Service, own the left-hand side in green. Uh, so that portion of the original, the original motel uh, the original, um, you know, area where King met, that, that suite, the lobby, is, is all owned outright by the National Park Service. All the rest of it is still owned by the City of Birmingham, although we do have a preservation easement uh, over the rest of the, of the property uh, with some very specific uh, stipulations about, um, obviously, uh, our ability to work together in uh, preserving that property. So, again, a lot of people think, gosh, you know, the Park Service owning a part of a motel in the city that seems like a really funky national park and i think in many respects yeah we thought so too initially but uh, uh but the more we worked together and the more we sort of worked on the elements of our partnership and that's why that was my word you know this fundamentally is a is a park it doesn't work without um uh, this specific relationship with the city of birmingham that uh, that we have codified through um through a number of legal instruments um and um and looking forward to the challenge of moving forward. And that's really what we want to spend most time talking about. So um, Jack uh, and his company did this historic structures report, which you've seen excerpts from, I think. And um, it uh, really, they've done some work figuring out what type of historic fabric is there, exterior, interior, 
Um, and then most importantly, it includes the recommendations for the treatment and use that we've come to jointly. Um, and um, I'm just going to remind folks, I can't remember if we've gone through this or not, but uh, right now the plan is to restore the exterior of the, uh, the 1954, so the original hotel. We're going to return it to its 1963 appearance. Um, we're going to restore the exterior of the 1968 edition to its 1968 appearance. Um, again, this is a, 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 a building that has evolved over time in lieu of, uh, of tearing down the 1968 edition and only preserving the piece that was there in 1963. We decided to, to keep the building in its entirety, but, uh, but try to restore it, uh, restore it to that sort of uh, phased 1963 to 1968 appearance from the outside. And then on the inside, um, very much uh, restoring the, the master suite, the lobby, certain rooms to their 1963 appearance, and then adaptively reusing the rest of the spaces in the, in the motel um, uh, for different purposes. And at this point, the, the vision that we have uh, is the Park Service will, will really just use that one little corner for interpretation. We're not anticipating at this point using any administrative space in the motel. We're hoping to use this building uh, as our sort of launching point to orient and people that are coming to, to experience the National Monument. It just makes sense. There's already so much wonderful interpretation and resources here to, to sort of leverage. So this would be sort of the main visitor contact, initial visitor contact spot for people coming to Birmingham uh, for, for the Civil Rights Institute and for the National Monument. Um, and from there, whether it's guided tours or self-guided tours of the, of the monument, there would be uh, a portion of it that would be restored. The, like I said, the lobby, the, the suite upstairs, maybe a couple of rooms. Uh, we're going to have to put in an elevator uh, to allow ADA accessibility to the second floor. We're going to probably put some restrooms uh, there as well. Uh, so adaptively, uh, reusing a couple of those uh, older rooms for, for those purposes. Uh, but the rest of it uh, is, is honestly, uh, and again, I don't know to what extent Irv and, and others have presented sort of the work of their work that they've done to help us figure out what is that sustainable business model for, for the city's part and, and even for the National Park Service part. Uh, but um, at this point, we're hoping to actually have a restaurant, uh, a functioning restaurant, uh, where the, the old one used to be, and, and actually using the, uh, the motel as a motel, renting rooms out, uh, either leasing it, you know, the Park Service owns a portion of that, maybe we lease it back to, uh, to the city uh, to allow them to do a master, master concessioner, master developer for, for, the, the, for the whole motel. But, um, but again, the key is going to be sort of the collective ability to, to sort of get the community going downtown and and make that a, a viable business model. The other thing that we've talked about, uh, again, in terms of adaptive reuse is um, the Civil Rights Institute would, I think, use a little more storage. Uh, so perhaps looking at some of the 1968 editions, maybe using some of the ground floor uh, rooms, turning those into archival storage or something like that, if we can get it configured correctly. Um, but those are very much works in progress. So um, again, one of the questions we're going to ask you later is if you have any you know, additional thoughts or ideas or, you know, you, you're smart people, uh, 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 for visitor experience, you're coming, what would you want to do, what, how would you want to experience this National Monument? That's what we want to hear from you, uh, for sure. Uh, I'm almost done, I, very, I promise. Uh, so partnerships, um, the proclamation itself very much directs us to, to partner with entities in the community. It lists by name the city, the Civil Rights Institute, 16th Street, Bethel Baptist. Uh, to do a number of things that we're very much committed to doing. Um, and again, I, um, I highlighted a lot of things that are already going on. Uh, you know, maybe the Park Service comes in, and I'll use 16th Street as an example, because we, we, we went to the church last night and several of the docents, so they, they lead tours Tuesday through Friday and on invitations on Saturday, right? And they, in the last three months, I think they said they had 17,000 people visit the church. That's a big number, right? Um, and so, um, you know, seeking to, uh, to sort of um, 
work with them on, on the programming that they give and maybe adding to some of their talking points. I'm sure their docents are wonderful, thoughtful people who tell great stories about 16th Street. Maybe we can sort of use that as an opportunity because Reggie doesn't have interpreters working for him now. Maybe we can sort of work with them to help tell a slightly broader story in the interim until we get some more staff. So um, anyway, the, the idea of, of leveraging the, the wonderful assets that are already here is fundamental to where this park is headed, uh, especially in the short term. Um, so that is really all I had. Um, so before I turn it over to Sarah, um, are there any questions from anybody about anything I went through? Yes, sir. Great question. So um, one of the specific things that uh, the, the very next things that Jack and his group are hopefully going to work on with us is a cultural landscape uh, report to uh, sort of make some decisions about what you just said. I mean, there's a lot of vegetation, especially on the sides. You know, if you look at the motel, there are these huge trees that are even sort of growing over the walls. Uh, you know, we might need to take those out because either A, they're, you know, damaging the, the structural integrity or perhaps uh, Obviously, if you go back to that cultural landscape, none of those were there in the first place. So, uh, so we will be initiating a, uh, a more detailed uh, conversation about the cultural landscape. The, Jack even mentioned this on our tour yesterday. There's a lot of landscape elements within the courtyard that are not there today that uh, we might seek to restore or, or figure out if we want to want to put back. Uh, there's a, a planter in the middle. There's the little... Um, um, patio area in the corner. There's just a lot of things that I think I need a little bit more uh, conversation about the landscape. And, and again, as, as you guys know, and as you're sort of working through your own things, that sort of your, your treatment strategies should be married up very much with your visitor experience and what you, what you, what you want your visitors to gain from, from what they see and, and what they hear when they come to visit. So it's not... Uh, it's not always just, uh, well, it, this is the way it looks, so let's take it back to that. It's, it's more nuanced than that, for sure. You are, you are very much a part of the monument. You're obviously included in the legislation. Uh, uh, you are not in the boundary of the National Monument. The physical boundary is that sort of weird, that thing that's just really here in downtown uh, Birmingham. Uh, The, uh, um, yeah, again, Shuttlesworth uh, figures prominently throughout the, that, uh, that proclamation that, that establishes this national monument. So, uh, you know, but it will be important. And, and again, you know, to every one of you that has a stake and represents an interest, and she's talking Bethel, there's others of you, I'm sure, that have, have your own thoughts and your own things maybe you're, you're wanting to talk to the Park Service about. That's Reggie's primary job initially is going to be opening that line of communication because that was another thing, just keeping it real, that we heard last night uh, from a lot of people was, man, the communication sometimes is just not good in, in understanding sort of, you know, who fits in where and, and, and so sort of improving communication with our partners is going to be, uh, I'm speaking for Reggie, but he's nodding, so uh, I hopefully I'm not saying things out of turn. That's going to be very important uh, for us moving forward because, again, if you don't, if you get off on the wrong foot, I mean, again, it's exciting to have a new park, blank canvas of sorts, uh, uh, but in many respects, if you get off on the wrong foot, <laughs> it's hard to bring it back. So, uh, so from our perspective, making sure that we have those conversations, make sure everybody understands uh, managing expectations. Uh, again, you know, the city, just being honest with folks, the city is just chomping at the bit to start doing things. And we are too, please don't misunderstand me. We're very ready to go, but, uh, but there's just some important relationship building that needs to happen uh, before you know, a lot of things get too far down the road with the establishment of this, uh, of this park here. So, so I, Cynthia Walton, if you wanna come up here and help me if I butcher something, but Cynthia, uh, Cynthia Walton works in our um, uh, cultural resources division and works a lot with these uh, with a lot of these external programs but um, but I'll take a shot at it and she can she can help me if I if I miss misrepresent things so 
I mean, there's a lot of designations, right? And most of you are preservation professionals, so, so you get those. Or if you don't, you know, there's the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, there's the National Historic Landmarks uh, uh, designation. And then obviously there's designation now as a, as a national park unit, right? And all of, each one of those um, uh, affords different levels of, of protection and um, coordination and responsibilities. I'm little, I'll work backwards and I'll let Cynthia maybe talk about the National Register or the National Historic Landmark status, but, but the, the, the National Monument boundary, here's, here's my message, and I think Reggie's as well, to anybody that's within that boundary. If you, if you own uh, a property in that boundary uh, and, and you think it's an important contributing resource to the story or, or what happened here, um, the reality is that we don't have any hooks. We don't have any regulations that we can uh, apply. We're not concurring. We're not in the review chain for uh, any kind of changes or things you're going to be uh, doing to those buildings. However, uh, we very much have an interest and a stake in what happens uh, and would like to be consulted uh, just as you would consult uh, you know, your neighbors or, uh, or the city for permits or any other sort of overlay regulatory framework that exists that are not federally mandated. Like most cases, there's federal, state, and local um, 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 things that, that, that apply to preservation. So in our case, with the National Monument, that's the best I can really say is that uh, um, we very much would like to find out and sort of work with you. And if, uh, if there's things that are being proposed that, say, are not consistent with with the historic nature of that building or that landscape, then we might have some suggestions for you. But at the end of the day, we're, we don't concur on those. Do you want to say anything about NHLs or National Register districts? Or for National Historic Landmarks, which with Bethel Baptist is a National Historic Landmark, if there is a federal undertaking, so if there's any federal funding, licensing, or permitting, the National Park Service, the regional office, we are required to be notified of that. And if there may be a potential that it could harm the property, we uh, are required to be invited to consult. So we weigh in and we you know, act as an advocate for the National Historic Landmark. Um, for the National Register properties, the National Park Service is not uh, as involved, but the staff over there at the um, Alabama Historical Commission, they are they are all um, always involved with those National Register properties, which is that federal um, hook. And if there's not a federal um, licensing, permitting, or funding, the, the National Historic Service for landmarks, at least, we still may, if a property owner is interested, um, act as an advocate and you know, weigh in if, if somebody invites us to. Yeah, so... Um, um you know, the proclamation itself gives us the legal authority to enter into these types of agreements. And with the city of Birmingham as an example, we have a very defined uh, uh, relationship, ownership interests, um, and so we are working to, um, to develop this cooperative management agreement that um, is going to figure out, uh, you know, who's going to manage what. I mean, that the whole idea is, even though there's two different owners, we're going to operate it as one entity. That's, that's fundamentally what we're seeking to do at the Gaston. Um, and so we very much need to develop a, a, some sort of a memorandum or a cooperative management agreement that, uh, that gets at that. I think with uh, some of these other entities like 16th Street or Bethel Baptist or these other ones, um, I think it just starts with a conversation of what are, where are our shared interests, right? What do, what do we want to sort of work on together, whether it's interpretation, preservation, um, you know, uh, I mean, those are the two obvious ones, but uh, maybe there's other things that, uh, that I'm not thinking of, but, uh, but that'll be part of our interest is to work with each of those named partners with physical resources and, and see if we can, you know, come up and develop uh, uh, an agreement. In some cases, um, it may be just technical assistance, it may be financial assistance, it may just be Reggie helping with interpretation. Uh, there's any number of things that, uh, that I think could be worked out in those types of agreements. Yeah. No, no. I mean, again, that, I, I guess I'll 
I'll say it again, that uh, if you're a private property owner, you know, we ha have no, with the exception of the things that Cynthia mentioned, if you're an NHL uh, and you're proposing alterations, you're supposed to go through the regional office and get their, their input on, uh, on those uh, alterations. And, and if presumably you're, you know, diminishing the character integrity for which it was established, then obviously that's a no-no. But uh, um, if any other sort of interests other than that, the Park Service doesn't have any specific review and approval authority, uh, but we certainly are interested and available to help out in, in terms of technical assistance for review or, uh, again. Yeah, I think a lot of what Jack, and I had to miss that, but the, you know, the, the whole idea of the Secretary of Interior standards and applying those and, and sort of thinking about your, your use and treatment relative to the historic uh, significance of that structure really is, is what you're seeking to do and define and, and work through that process. And there's a lot of uh, 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 entities that can help with, uh, help with that. Well, le let, me, let me interject here because there's lots of really wonderful conversations. Uh, honestly, that's what today, I mean, this is starting that. I mean, look, the, what, we're, what, what are the biggest challenges facing the Park Service? What are the biggest opportunities? Everything you've said is fundamentally what we want to hear and what we want to start having a direct dialogue with you and uh, on these, these tough subjects. And, um, and so uh, I can't say anything. I guess if I was a pastor at a church at this point, I'd call, call you to the front to, to join, you know, what, 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 join the movement, you know, come join the, uh, come join the National Monument uh, because we do want, and, and, and I, I totally understand where you're coming from and, and the concerns uh, about that sort of political nature of things. But it, at this point, I mean, Reggie can weigh in, and, and I, I do want Reggie to say, say something. Um, we're approaching it very much as a blank slate of, of trying to, to work with you individually. We completely recognize that the, the stories, the information, the feelings, the uh, tangible, intangibles, all the things we talked about yesterday in terms of those interpretive experiences, man, we, we don't know that, and we need that from you. And again, there's people that have already developed those, and Priscilla is one of them. And and uh, you know, obviously, there's a lot of stuff here, but uh, we're, we, if if there's gaps or things that aren't told well and like they should be, then then that's the whole point of this exercise, uh, starting this week, and it's not going to happen overnight, clearly. So, any Reggie, you want to offer any? Um, I'm, I'm extremely happy you, you mentioned that. Um, you know, th the foundation document is one planning process. My favorite process is the long range interpretive planning process. And, and I see us doing that a little bit different for Birmingham and for Freedom Riders because people have a lot of stories to tell. I can see us having a session at, at Bethel and 16th Street, right. gathering all those folks together to put that into context. Uh, many times, and I mentioned this yesterday, long range planning and, and how the story can get watered down. Uh, uh, visitors don't come to parks for watered down stories. They want to feel the emotion and step back into time, if you will. That's the reason why we restore things. We preserve them, of course, but they want to step back into time. If you go to uh, Springfield, Illinois, to where Lincoln's home was, you step back into time because those buildings take you back there. Then those interpreter and docents tell the story. But I'll never be able to tell the story the same way as folks that lived it. However, I can get those stories uh, fine-tuned so that a young person and, and volunteers from that period can come and take it to a different level. So uh, I can assure you during my time here is that we will turn the bolts as tight as we possibly can. Uh, history can be uncomfortable, but that's where growth comes from. We find out who we are when, when we're in those times of struggle. Um, and, and that's the reason why I'm enjoying my time here because I'm seeing both sides of the fence in terms of why we should tell these stories or why we shouldn't tell these stories. That's the very reason why we should tell these stories authentically, holistically, to ensure that folks understand the pain and the suffering 
that occurred. But then also talk about the rebirth of people being equal, moving that way. And we're still moving that way currently. So um, I challenge us to do things a little bit differently here as it relates to the long range interpretive planning process that'll give us the foundation to be able to tell those stories. Uh, I was having a conversation just before we started about George Washington Carver. And I didn't know who George Washington Carver was. I knew this character, character of George Washington Carver when I went there as superintendent. But as I started peeling back the layers of this complex individual, he was more than just about plants and, and changing the agricultural south. Uh, he was a different type of man. And, and there's even today ways to dig deeper into his story, you know, who his father was. Nobody wants to have that conversation. I have my ideas based on my own personal research, but we can't be afraid to tell the stories as he is, because that's what people are expecting every single day that they come to a national park site, regardless if it's Yellowstone and protecting the buffalo or the wolves, but also these folks who live a certain way. We can't just gloss over it. Uh, I think, uh, and, and your name is slipping me, we don't want to airbrush history. Take away the pieces that, you know, now if I was on the cover of a magazine, as I look now, they could airbrush me down to 175 pounds of muscle, okay? But that's not who I am at this particular point, unless I decide to sculpture myself to that that place. So let's tell the whole story and I think that's what we're going to do with each individual um, partner. I think that that's what we owe the, the, the civil rights movement, the American history of the civil rights movement. Thank you very much. Uh, um, honestly, the, this is such a powerful, wonderful dialogue and, and, and so important for us. Um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah uh, to sort of uh, finish up and what we want to do, I'm going to fast forward so she can go even quicker, uh, what we want to do is break you up into groups and have the conversation you just had. So, so it was like a primer, right, a, a bit of a precursor uh, to, to sort of make your way around the room to the different stations. Um, she's going to set some sideboards to help you think about uh, some of the things we're going to be hoping to get from you. Um, but. Um, all right. All right. <clears throat> All right, I had to take this off because the podium makes me look pretty short. <laughs> all right, so um, thank you all for coming. This has been a really powerful conversation. I think one that's actually extremely relevant to what we'll be doing next. So thank you for bringing up these challenging questions. And also I feel this spirit of weak hope for the future. So that's really exciting. Um, my name is Sarah Bodo. I work for the National Park Service out of our um, planning division. It's called the Denver Service Center. So we do planning projects throughout the nation with different national parks. And the planning product that we are working on uh, really starting this week with all of you is called a foundation document. So what is a foundation document? So we say it's an underlying guidance document for management and planning decisions in a national park unit. So you all have done a lot of work with ideas for the Gaston Hotel. Um, you are at each of your own sites, you have fully developed programming. Um, so this feels like kind of taking a step back but I think it's an important step for the National Park Service in particular, um, but also potentially for collaboration. So the foundation document is, is short, and we have some examples up here on the table. They um, really describe why the monument was established, and that's directly from the presidential proclamation, and what is important to preserve there, so really what's there. All right, so some of the elements that end up in the foundation document are these. The first is a purpose statement, and that is grounded in park legislation, or in this case, the presidential proclamation. 
So that's really what the president said this park is supposed to do. And I use the term park because in the National Park Service, um, we treat national monuments, national seashores, national battlefields, all the same. The laws apply the same. So you'll hear me say park a lot. The foundation document also contains a set of significant statements. And that's usually um, somewhere in the realm of three to five or three to six or such individual sentences that describe the national significance of what is here within this national monument. So it should talk a little bit about what's here and why those things are important in our nation's history and heritage. Another component is kind of a tongue twister, fundamental resources and values. Um, and those are actually those physical things, those resources, right? Like the A.G. Gaston Motel is a resource that exists here. And that's why this is that place where these stories should be told, because the resources are here. So we want to understand what those important resources and values. Sometimes there's um, something that's not quite so tangible. For instance, at some national cemeteries, a um, feeling of remembrance or contemplation is such an important value that you want to protect at that site. You want to manage for it. So these um, will identify a number of fundamental resources and values that are key to preserving, to protect the national monuments, national significance. If you did not protect and preserve those fundamental resources, the significance of the site could be jeopardized or would be jeopardized. Then the foundation document also contains interpretive themes. And for those of you that were here yesterday, I think I talked a little bit about this. Um, we're looking at developing very broad, high-level primary interpretive themes. So again, it, it tends to be in the range of three to six themes, the broadest themes that are important to tell at this national monument. And then um, through the long-range interpretive plan that Reggie talked about, those themes are used to then develop sub-themes and programming. So every unit of the National Park Service has a foundation document. Um, so as you can tell, it's something that we view as pretty important. It's really that base level, that first management planning document that other plans tier from and management decisions tier from. So it is used as a check against big decisions in the future. Because you want to check and see, how does this decision affect our purpose statement? Is it in line with our significance, et cetera? All right, so these documents are fairly short. Um, we have a, like, there may be 50 pages or less, and then we also have an overview document that's really more of our public document. So since they're short, they can't get into everything. They do not describe how to manage, and therefore they're not considered um, a decision document. So National Park Service believes that foundation documents are useful for a lot of reasons. Um, some of them include that just they're the starting point for management planning and decision making. They provide some consistency in park planning. They can also focus efforts. So especially for like really big national parks that maybe have 500 buildings. Some of those are historic, some of those are not. Some of those relate to the purpose and significance of the site, others may not. The foundation document should help us understand um, which ones are most important in that sense, and which ones in times of budget crunches maybe deserve less attention. And then foundation documents also contain a little bit of strategic planning. So we look at the resources and we identify conditions, threats, um, issues and opportunities facing those fundamental resources and values. And then we will also identify and prioritize the planning needs and data needs associated with those resources. And lastly, we use it as a, as a communication tool. So it's particularly um, 
relevant within the agency, but also with partner organizations, um, new, new managers, et cetera. Okay, so this project is really starting now with all of you as well as public input. Um, we'll be working on the document this summer and fall. We will come back to really develop the document with um, park regional staff and then some stakeholders as well. And then it'll be completed in 2018. And at that point, the public and everyone will be able to see what, what came out of that. Oh, be able to, to see the final documents. All right, so here's what we're doing today. So we really do want your insights and understanding. Um, we have four questions placed around the room that we're hoping to have discussions at, each one of those. And your feedback will go into the foundation document in some form. So I will read the questions and then explain the exercise. So the first one is, why are the AG Gaston Motel and other places associated with the National Monument? So that includes the 16th Street Baptist Church, Bethel Baptist Church, St. Paul United Methodist Church, Kelly Ingram Park, Fourth Avenue Business District, the Masonic Temple. Why are these places important to American history? What ideas or ideals do these places represent? And that station, I believe, is up there. Our second question is, what should people know about the struggle for human and civil rights in Birmingham? What are the most important stories? Georgia, I'm expecting to see you at this station. <laughs> but you'll get a chance to visit them all. Um, our third question is, what are the biggest challenges facing the National Park Service in setting up the National Monument? And that station is over in this side. And the fourth question is, what are the biggest opportunities for the National Park Service in setting up the National Monument? And additionally, what is your vision for the National Monument? So you can get really creative with Ben over here. Okay, for the public meetings, um, and we, aren't, we don't have a station for this, but we also ask this additional question. And this one is, do you have any other ideas or information you would like to share with the Park Service about the National Monument? And we really are asking for help from members of the public um, if there are any stories, old photos, or memories about the site that folks are willing to share. We would love to get your contact information. So I'll say that to you all as well, although I believe that since you've been working together, you probably already know that, right? Brent's probably said, asked that same question in the past. Um, so we do have these different stations set up. What we wanna do is, oh wait, I did have one more slide, sorry. So in addition to talking with us today, there are other opportunities to comment. Um, we have some comment cards right up here. So if you want to take one home, if you have other ideas that you want to share with us, write them down, put that in the mail. Um, postage is paid on those already. We have a website, and I'll leave that up here. You can provide comments online, and then an email address that we, we also welcome your comments through email. Um, so we have like a formal comment period that's open through July 17th, and feel free to share this information with your friends, neighbors, um, constituents, colleagues. We really would love to hear from a lot of people. And while we welcome comments at any time, really they'll be most helpful for our process by Jul if we get them by July 17th. All right, so let me see what time it is here. Okay, so what I was thinking is I will explain the exercise, maybe we could take a 10 minute break and then come back and get started on it. Does that sound good? Okay, so what we wanted to do was um, encourage some small group discussions at each of these stations. And we want to also give you a chance to visit each station and provide your ideas and talk with the other colleagues you have here. So when we come back from break, um, take a seat or congregate around one of these boards. And it doesn't have to be evenly dispersed. Um, 
just go where you want to go. We'll start having a conversation about that question. And myself, Ben, Cynthia, and Chuck will be writing down your thoughts and trying to get them as correctly as possible on our flip charts. We're going to spend about 15 minutes in, at that station. And at that time, I'll set a timer on my alarm or my phone. Um, and then I'll ask you to switch and go to another station. You don't have to stay with the same group. You can go wherever you want to go. If you want to skip a station and stay at one for two sessions, you can do that too. We're not going to be picky about this. Um, so we'll have four sessions like that, 15 minutes each. After that, we'll have a, a report out for each of those stations so that everybody, if you visited that question first, you'll get to hear what other folks said after you left it. Sound all right? Any questions about that? Yeah, for our National Park Service acronym, is that what you're saying? So we do it B-I-C-R, which is, we use the first two letters of the first word and the first two letters of the second word is how we tend to do it. Oh, yes, you're right. Thank you. Um, and then... So it's Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument. So you're right, this should have been B-I-C-I, but there's also, there's already a national park with that acronym. We use a lot of acronyms. I don't know if you know that. Um, so one other thing before I set you on break is that we're also here this week to start a foundation document process for the Freedom Riders National Monument. And we will be doing a similar meeting with stakeholders in the morning on Thursday, as well as a public meeting in Anniston on Thursday evening. So we welcome any of you to join that as well. Any other questions? Okay, why don't we take 10 minute break? So come back at 1055.